Thank you, Marty, for that introduction, and thank you to the officers and trustees of the Institute of General Semantics for the kind invitation uh, to do this at the very last minute. <laughs> I want to thank you all for your warm welcome. I'm especially gratified to receive your applause coming as it has before I've done anything to earn it. <laughs> this bodes well for this evening. As Benjamin Franklin put it, blessed are the ones who expect nothing, for they shall never be disappointed. <laughs> so God bless you all. And as for whether I will say anything that will be worth applauding, I suppose we will both find out before the night is through. It's a distinct honor and a privilege to follow in the footsteps of so many distinguished Korzybski lecturers. As you've heard, Alfred Korzybski, a Polish nobleman and engineer, came to North America and became the founder of General Semantics. Korzybski's goal was nothing less than sanity. The individual sanity needed to lead a good life and the collective sanity that would yield peace and justice for the whole of humanity. To that end, he developed a system designed to teach us to be thoughtful and reflective, to delay our responses rather than give in to knee-jerk reactions, to engage in reality testing and fact-checking, to look for the evidence to support or refute any claims being made, to shed our prejudices and presumptions about the world and pay attention to what is going on, to ask, what is really going on here? To understand that reality is dynamic, ever-changing, and more complex than we can ever fully grasp. That we can only take in a little bit of it, and only indirectly. That our perceptions are further influenced, modified, and distorted by the language and symbols that we use. That we never truly know the territory, we can only make maps of it but that some maps are more accurate than others. So we should learn how to be the best map makers that we possibly can. And that some maps are more effective at getting us where we need to go than others. So we should learn how to recognize those maps that can do a good job in guiding us and recognize those maps that will lead us astray. Korzybski's follower and most successful popularizer was S.I. Hayakawa. Hayakawa was a Canadian, his parents having come from Japan to Vancouver, later settling in Winnipeg. He went on to earn his doctorate in U.S., become an English professor and then president at San Francisco State College, and eventually, as you heard, a United States senator. So, Hayakawa and Korzybski were two very different individuals. But apart from general semantics, what did the two of them have in common? Both were immigrants. And like so many other immigrants to the United States, both came here and made very significant contributions to our society. And I think it's worth noting that both had good reasons to leave here after arriving. Korzybski was a Polish nobleman holding a rank equivalent to that of a count. The nation of Poland had just regained its independence after the First World War following more than a century of foreign rule. Korzybski could have returned home to his ancestral lands, his title and his servants, but he didn't. And Hayakawa was well aware of the fact that his fellow Japanese Americans, those happening, who happened to live on the West Coast, were forced into internment camps during the Second World War. And he himself was subject to the prejudice and discrimination suffered by so many minorities in the United States. He could have returned to Canada, but he didn't. Now, no doubt there were many reasons why they both remained in the U.S. But if I may be permitted a bit of speculation, I'd like to suggest that one reason had something to do with the fact that this nation was born out of the ideals of the Enlightenment. 
It was created by founders who are philosophers and scientists. It was based on a belief in rationality, the free marketplace of ideas, and pragmatism. It was a nation that celebrated scientific discovery and invention, that engaged in extraordinary feats of engineering, and maintained a belief in progress, that things can and should get better, and will get better if we only put our minds to it. I want to suggest that they recognized that this was fertile ground for general semantics, that Korzybski's non-Aristotelian system could only be built on a foundation of freedom and equality, democracy and the rule of law, and reason and empiricism. Now, Neil Postman was another prominent intellectual who embraced general semantics. And he was also a leader of the countercultural educational reform movement of the 60s and 70s. He was lead author of teaching as a subversive activity. And while he later countered with teaching as a conserving activity, he still maintained a strong affiliation with progressive politics throughout his life. But unlike other social critics like Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn, Postman saw past all the ugliness that is a part of American history and defended the value of the American experiment. Postman recognized that the United States was the first nation to be founded on the basis of a reasoned argument. And in Postman's final work, Building a Bridge to the 18th Century, he argued not for a return to the past, but a retrieval of enlightenment ideals as essential for life in the 21st century. So I want to suggest that Korzybski, Hayakawa, and Postman all saw something familiar in the founders of this nation in Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, and all the rest, recognizing that they were flawed human beings but capable of rising above the limitations of their time and place and expressing in their writings ideas of universal value. And so I want to ask you to think about what would those founders of our republic say if they could see what has become of their invention? If they could see with their 18th century eyes the United States of the 21st century. Now I'm certain they would marvel at the technological progress we've made. I also believe they would appreciate the progress we've made toward the ideals articulated in the Declaration of Independence, that all persons are created equal, that all are endowed <coughs> with basic human rights, beginning with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But what would they say about what's happened to the American experiment in democracy that they had initiated? You know, when the Constitutional Convention met in Philadelphia in 1787, and the delegates were leaving Independence Hall, a certain Mrs. Powell asked of Benjamin Franklin, well, doctor, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy? To which Franklin famously replied, a republic if you can keep it. And what would our time-traveling founders say about us today, about whether it looks like we'll be able to keep it, or about whether we have kept it or already lost it? They would certainly recognize that we never established any form of monarchy or any more modern form of authoritarian government. What George Orwell depicted in his novel, 1984, would have been more extreme than anything Benjamin Franklin had known, but he could easily have understood the basic premise of coercion, oppression, and fear under which a totalitarian society operates. What Franklin and his peers never imagined in their wildest dreams was that the republic might be lost not by force of arms, but by fulfillment of our desire to have fun. And he therefore would have been baffled by the kind of dystopia depicted by Aldous Huxley in his novel, Brave New World. 
But I believe that he would have agreed that Huxley proved to be more prophetic than Orwell, as Neil Postman observed in his best-known book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. And it is worth reading the following passage that introduces that book. Neil Postman wrote, what Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. <laughs> Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture, preoccupied with some equivalent of the feelies, the orgy, porgy, and the centrifugal bumble puppy. As Huxley remarked in Brave New World Revisited, the civil libertarians and rationalists failed to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. In 1984, Huxley added, people are controlled by inflicting pain. In Brave New World, they're controlled by inflicting pleasure. In short, Orwell feared that what we hate will ruin us. Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. Now, thinking about how our visitors from the past might react to Postman's analysis of how public discourse is shaped by our media of communication, I'd like to believe that they would find a glimmer of hope in the fact that he had identified where we've gone wrong, thereby pointing to the way that we might make things better. And since this is my thought experiment, I'd also like to believe that they'd be encouraged by my own book, Amazing Ourselves to Death, Neil Postman's Brave New World Revisited, and that they'd also might take some small comfort in what I have to say to you tonight. Our friends from the 18th century would certainly have been familiar with the old saying, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. It's a popular metaphor for irresponsible and foolish action in the face of serious events. Fiddling while Rome burns has been used in particular to refer to inaction on the part of political leaders in the face of a crisis. But as citizens in a democracy, democracy responsible for governing ourselves, there are no solo acts when it comes to fiddling around. We're all playing in the band. Fiddling while Rome burns might have been an alternate title for amusing ourselves to death, which Postman wrote, not in puritanical condemnation of all pastimes and leisure pursuits, not as an elitist screed bemoaning the poor taste of youth today or the loss of manners and moral standards. The problem that Postman identified is not that we seek pleasure or like to have fun. Our amusements are part of what make us human. The problem instead is one of context. In the context of a city on fire, we ought to expect a serious response from our leaders, not a musical one. In the context of certain activities, such as a courtroom trial, religious ceremony, or classroom, we ought to expect a certain measure of decorum and behavior appropriate to such situations, at the very least to prevent their disruption. And in the context of vital matters that must be dealt with within a democratic society, we ought to expect serious discussion and debate as a basis for making decisions. Understanding context is at the core of Postman's message and understanding eloquently expressed in Ecclesiastes, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Postman's argument is that there is a time for amusement and a time to be serious. And as our media and technology have expanded our ability to amuse ourselves, we've lost the ability to distinguish between the two, blurring the boundaries in favor of amusement. As a consequence, we find ourselves suffering from too much of a good thing. We know quite well that too much 
of the food that nourishes us leads to obesity. That too much of the exercise that strengthens the body can cause it damage. And that too large a dose of medicine that cures disease can be deadly. The primary value for any ecological system is balance. And Postman identified late 20th century American culture as dangerously out of balance. His reference to death in the book's title was no mere hyperbole, but an indication that our loss of balance has called into question the very survival of our culture, of liberal democracy, and even of humanity as a species. So whether the tune we imagine Nero playing was a raucous fire on the mountain or a sedate rendition of hearts and flowers, in the face of such nihilistic soundtracks, we might invoke an altogether different, more hopeful music, that of Fiddler on the Roof. In that musical, Tevye, the main character, says of himself and his fellow villagers that every one of us is a fiddler on the roof trying to scratch out a pleasant, simple tune without breaking his neck. Context and balance are two fundamental elements of an ecological approach to understanding media, which is to say that they are fundamental to the field of media ecology, defined by Postman as the study of media as environments. This approach can be summed up by Marshall McLuhan's famous maxim, the medium is the message. To put it succinctly, the medium is the message asks us to pay attention to how we do things, because the way that we do things has much to do with what we end up doing. And the way that we do things has much to do with what we end up when we do the things we do. And the way that we do things has much to do with who we become by doing the things we do and ending up with what we end up with. As the anthropologist Edmund Carpenter explained, and I quote here, I think media are so powerful they swallow cultures. I think of them as invisible environments which surround and destroy old environments. Sensitivity to problems of culture conflict and conquest becomes meaningless here, for media play no favorites. They conquer all cultures. One may pretend that media preserve and present the old by recording it on film and tape, but that is mere distraction, a sleight of hand possible when people keep their eyes focused on content. So Carpenter suggests that what's been happening to American culture is not unique that our evolving electronic media environment is encompassing and mutating cultures all around the world, that every nation is in the process of amusing, informing, and amazing itself to death. At this point, let me acknowledge that I'm trying to provide a brief explanation of the field of media ecology, and I've already exceeded the time limit for what has come to be known as an elevator speech or elevator pitch. As you may know, the concept is based on the way in which an elevator ride shapes our relationships and our discourse, given the fact that it's characterized by a captive audience, a relatively intimate space, and a relatively brief duration. <laughs> we might contrast it to the ways in which our relationship and forms of discourse are influenced by the characteristics of a lecture hall or a living room, or a bar room. And we might also look at how all those instances differ from the relationships and forms of discourse we encounter when we read a book, or go to the movies, or use social media. We're influenced and in many ways shaped by our environments, by the biophysical environment, the technological environment, and the symbolic environment that we inhabit. This means that changes to our environments can have profound effects on the way that we think, feel, act, use our senses, organize ourselves collectively, and create and maintain cultural continuities. 
When you introduce a change into a system, its effects can give rise to secondary effects and those to tertiary effects, and they're all interacting on and on. That's why we understand that the introduction of a new medium has an ecological effect, not simply additive, but transformative. And because of the complexity of ecological change, we should understand that some of the effects will be unanticipated, unpredictable, that we'll never know for certain all the consequences of any given change, any given innovation. This means there will always be negative effects that accompany the positive effects, that every benefit will come with a cost. And it may well be that the benefit will be worth the cost, but does it really make sense to buy into the innovation without first looking at the price tag? The old sales slogan, buy now, pay later, pretty much sums up our contemporary approach to technology. And much like buying on credit, we never really know how much we'll end up paying for our purchases in the end. Now we know that our species is distinguished by its unique capacity for language and symbolic communication, which in turn grants us the potential to engage in what Korzybski referred to as time binding. The ability to pass on knowledge over time from generation to generation and also to evaluate that knowledge, correct our mistakes, and to make progress. That ability vastly accelerates as we develop ways of recording language in the form of writing. And that results in the transition from tribal societies to more complex forms of social organization, such as associated with settlements, cities, kingdoms, and empires. And it was alphabetic writing, in particular, that gave Western culture its distinctive characteristics. While the invention of the printing press with movable type is closely associated with the shift from the medieval to the modern in the West. Now the electronic media have brought that modern era to a close, moving us into some new period of time that some people refer to as postmodern. Of course, this spells the end not only of modernity, but of almost 4,000 years of Western culture. And that's why McLuhan once pointed to a TV set and he said, I quote, do you really want to know what I think of that thing? If you want to save one shred of Hebraeo, Greco, Roman, medieval, Renaissance, Enlightenment, modern Western civilization, you'd better get an ax and smash all the sets. Now, McLuhan was being a bit extreme, you might say. Even Postman, who is often labeled a neo-Luddite, would agree. But the important point is that all of the benefits that we have grant gained from our electronic media have come with a cost, and we need to know what the cost has been and what it yet might be. We can start by noting that the first form of alphabetic writing, the Semitic alphabet, is used by the ancient Israelites is associated with the introduction of monotheism and religion based on a sacred text, the first historical narrative, the first system of codified law, and with it a generalized conception of justice and human rights. This was followed by the Greek alphabet, which made possible rhetoric and philosophy, theater and theoretical science, the first monetary system, and the first form of democratic government. And the printing press extended the impact of the written word while also introducing new effects of its own. Print media increased access to information dramatically, leading to a knowledge explosion as easy access to the accumulated knowledge of centuries past facilitated scholarship, spurring on research, leading to the rise of modern science and with it what became known as the age of reason, the enlightenment. Printing created a reading public which constitutes the basis of democracy. Increased access to political information made it impossible for kings to argue that you commoners do not know enough to govern yourselves. So that by breaking the state's monopoly of knowledge, democratic revolutions of the modern era took place. As Thomas Carlyle wrote in the 19th century, it's a quote, 
He who first shortened the labor of copyists by device of movable types was disbanding hired armies and cashiering most kings and senates and creating a whole new democratic world. So printing did enhance centralized political, economic, and social control. It did lead to the building of colonial empires but it also made possible the enlightenment ideals of political emancipation, self-government, and equality with new emphasis on individualism, rationalism, and the scientific method. So the typographic media environment gave rise to the enlightenment, which in turn resulted in the creation of the American Republic, the first nation to be founded on the basis of a reasoned, logical, argument as put forth in the Declaration of Independence. The 18th century media environment was one in which the spoken and written word achieved a fruitful but delicate balance that was given special protection by our First Amendment guarantees, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. So what happened to public discourse over the past century and a half? We could boil it down to three factors. The first involves images, from the invention of photography to subsequent developments in graphics, film, television, video, we've mutated into an image culture. And images tend to evoke feelings and emotions rather than lines of rational thought and a coherent organization of ideas. The second factor is information. The problem is that our capacity to transmit and store information has continued to expand over the past two centuries, so we find ourselves living in a time of TMI, too much information, information overload. We find it difficult to make sense of so much stimuli, to properly evaluate messages, and to determine what actually may be relevant to our lives. And the third factor is immediacy, beginning with the telegraph, electricity made instantaneous transmission of messages possible, and that contributes to information overload and incoherence as there's no time to sort things out, especially as the acceleration of communication favors rapid turnover over any type of contextualization. Speed also gives us an abbreviated form of discourse, the sort we associate with the telegram, the newspaper headline, the advertising slogan, and more recently, the text message status update and the tweet. Contemporary critics such as Nicholas Carr note that while there's a significant amount of reading that still takes place, especially online, it's not the deep reading associated with print culture, but instead a kind of rapid scanning and skimming accompanied by a good deal of clicking and linking and clicking and linking. Speed also places a new emphasis on efficiency, which is essentially a numbers game based on measurement and statistical analysis. And in this sense, the balance between the spoken and written word comes under assault from another direction in the form of counting and calculation. We're caught between two extremes of image and number of the irrational and the hyper-rational. So images, information and immediacy come together as never before with the medium of television. With television, language takes a back seat to the image as the medium allows us to see what is happening for ourselves as it is happening. Words are no longer the main source of information as they were for print media and to a large extent for radio. For example, listening to a ball game on radio, we're entirely dependent on the announcer's report on the action. Watching it on television, we see what it's, what's happening as it happens, at the same time that the announcers see it, so that their report is reduced to commentary after the fact. As Walter Ong argues, and I quote, not all television presentations are simultaneous with reality, but in a way all television presentations seem to be. The fact that the instrument is capable of such presentations defines its impact, is saying that the television broadcast communicates always in the present tense, 
which instills in us a myopic form of present-mindedness. Over the, past, the three decades that followed the publication of Amusing Ourselves to Death, our media environment has evolved through the vast expansion of television via cable and satellite, and through the addition of the internet, the web, social media, and mobile technology. What then has happened to the American experiment in the contemporary media environment? I think it's almost enough to say Donald Trump is president and drop the microphone. <laughs> but just in case some of you are about to accuse me of political bias, I want to make it clear that I would say the same thing if it were Alec Baldwin or George Clooney or Oprah Winfrey. This is not about issues or ideology or political party. Rather, it is about the fact that for the first time in our nation's history, the person who is president of the United States has had no prior government or military experience. We have a president who has had none of the preparation or qualifications that have traditionally been associated with the office. This is not to deny that Trump has enjoyed a measure of success in business. Just how successful he's been is a subject of some controversy and debate. Us New Yorkers know that he's not the biggest real estate developer here, not even, doesn't even make the top ten. But what he excelled at more than anything else was public relations and marketing, the pursuit of publicity, high visibility, and branding his name and his face. Long before he set his sights on politics, he was a celebrity. Celebrities defined by Daniel Borston are known for their well-knownness. <laughs> Which is to say he was famous for finding ways to be written and talked about, appear and appear on the mass media. Apart from news and gossip columns, Trump has appeared in 13 movies a number of television commercials and music videos, three Playboy softcore videos, 20, 20 different television programs, including multiple appearances on WWE Raw, two stints hosting Saturday Night Live, and of course, he was the star of The Apprentice and The Celebrity Apprentice for 14 years. 14 years. A recent study by psychologist Shira Gabrielle concludes that Trump's long run on reality television was instrumental in his successful presidential campaign. Television, unlike print, gives rise to parasocial relationships. That is, it creates an illusion of intimacy, a sense that we really know the people we see on the screen in the same way that we know people that we have face-to-face -face relationships with. And we're more likely to vote for our televisual friends than we are for some cold and distant strangers. I'd suggest that Trump's television experience served him particularly well as he was a contestant in our longest running reality TV series, which could be called, Who Wants to Be the President? <laughs> The slogan from that other long-running series, Survivor, could just as easily apply, outwit, outplay, outlast. <laughs> the two are easy to confuse as both conclude with all but one player being voted off the island. And it's not that being telegenic will guarantee victory, but it does seem that candidates who are not telegenic will go down in defeat, regardless of their qualifications. And it may be hard to believe nowadays, but there was a time when appearing on an entertainment program was considered beneath the dignity of a serious politician. Now, it's part of every candidate's campaign strategy. Once elections are over, image politics persist as part and parcel of governing, of promoting policies and political advocacy. For example, on March 11, 2014, President Obama appeared on the comedy program hosted by Zach Galifianakis, Between Two Ferns. His, motion, his motivation being to urge young adults to sign up for health care. 
There's no question that the segment was highly entertaining, indeed quite hilarious. There's no question that he was able to reach his target audience. The question instead is whether the message he was trying to convey got through at all, or whether it was lost in the context of comedy and sarcasm. And the overarching question is whether the blurring of entertainment and politics makes it at all possible to engage in the serious discourse that's vital to our democracy. And yes, social media has also become a factor, for example, in Trump's use of Twitter. But this only adds to the illusion of intimacy with the celebrity, ultimately producing more heat than light, emphasizing drama, conflict, and humor, rather than serious discussion and debate. You know, newspapers had their fault, but faults but there was a time when a serious person would never admit to getting news from television alone. That's what Trump did when asked about the source of his views on military intervention on Meet the Press during the 26th campaign. His, his response was, and I quote, well, I watch the shows, I mean, I really see a lot of great, you know, when you watch your show and all of the other shows and you have the generals and you have certain people, a response is very much in keeping with the incoherence of television itself. <laughs> television news bouncing from one unrelated story to another and then off to a series of unrelated commercials and back. You know, 30 years ago, broadcast journalists working on the network news complained that they had less than half an hour to report on the day's events, so they could not help but be much more than a headline service. Now that we have cable news channels with 24-hour news cycles, we find the coverage isn't much different. As it turns out, most people tune into cable stations, news stations, only for a limited time. So rather than lose viewers, they tend to provide repetition in place of depth. The news stories kept short out of concern of losing the audience's attention. Essentially, Fox News, CNN, and MSNBC discovered they could build larger audiences by providing more entertaining pr programming, emphasizing dramatic confrontations that resemble not so much newspaper op-eds, but confrontations on televised wrestling programs. You know, the old TV news adage, if it bleeds, it leads, perfectly sums up the fact that decisions on what stories to report, how much time to devote to them, where to place them in the program, are heavily influenced by the presence or absence of compelling footage. This trend has been greatly amplified by the ready availability of video recorded on smartphones, dashboard cameras, surveillance video and the like, and so we find that caught on camera is a new genre, a new kind of news program, one whose only rationale is to collect and present video clips that would attract the attention and interest and amusement of viewers. In this way, journalism is reduced to a spin-off of America's funniest home videos. <laughs> but why not? Postman pointed this out. News, television news programs are called shows. Make them a part of show business. They have theme music. The newscasters wear makeup. They have their hair styled. They're costumed appropriately. They become celebrities. They appear in movies and on episodes of TV series, blurring the line between fiction and nonfiction. And new media do not provide an adequate substitute for professional journalism. Twitter simply gives us a new form of telegraphic discourse, while YouTube and Instagram are new manifestations of image culture. The internet contributes in a major way to information overload, so much so that we have difficulty separating accurate reporting from fake news and false rumors. A recent study by data scientists at MIT revealed that false information spreads faster and farther on Twitter than verifiable accounts. And it's clear that Facebook is no better. And social media, of course, do not pr provide a shared forum for discussion and deliberation as much as they situate us in isolated silos intensifying the divisions in our society. When we think of the American experiment, we think first about politics. We think second about the press, that is the media. 
that provide us with information needed to govern ourselves. I want to suggest that we also need to acknowledge the importance of religion as the basis of our sense of justice, equality, and human rights. And therefore, we need to consider the fact that participation in organized religion has been steadily declining since the 50s, just as television had become universally adopted. And while the electronic media provide us with substitutes, what happens to religious experience when it becomes televised or tweeted or Instagrammed? How different does it become as compared with the experience of watching a poignant film on HBO? As Walter Ong explained, sound is intimately connected to a sense of the sacred, the human voice, the most distinctive and unique element of the human person is produced by breath, which is a closely associated with spirit and life itself. And it's worth asking, therefore, if it makes a difference if the voices we hear in song and prayer are breathless in the sense of being electronically disembodied. The problem is always is one of context. Participating in a religious ritual places us in a special context that's different from all other contexts, situates us in a distinct media environment, one that asks us to play different roles and play by different rules. Whether the location is a church, a synagogue, a temple, a mosque, outdoors, even in a rented hall, religious experience, as Mircea Eliade explains, is characterized by a sense of sacred time and sacred space, separate and distinct from profane space and time. So what happens to our sense of sacred space and time when congregants in the pews hear a cell phone ringing, receive text messages, even stop to answer them? Much of our experience of the sacred is strongly associated with voice and sound, but it's also connected to quiet and silence. Many religions incorporate silent prayer in their worship services, and silence is integral to contemplation and meditation. During the 20th century, and especially in the aftermath of the Second World War, there was quite a bit of discussion concerning what was referred to as God's silence. Walter Ong suggested that it may be not so much that God has stopped speaking to us as it is that our electronic media generates so much noise that we've drowned out that still small voice. Now, whether religious experience is conceived of as communion with something greater than ourselves, whether it's a personal deity or a transcendent understanding of the universe, or whether it's simply a matter of an inner journey, a soul searching, an effort to better understand our own minds and consciousness. But the loss of silence, the constant deluge of distractions can be nothing short of devastating to our collective spiritual health as well as our prospects for cultural survival. And when it comes to education, schooling has always been about learning to read and write. Television and the electronic media offer us something different and, in, and an incompatible curriculum, and therefore it's worth asking if it's in the best interests of very young children to spend time watching programs such as Teletubbies, Booba, and Yo Gabba Gabba. <laughs> Cable television has given us specialized educational programming via the National Geographic Channel, the History Channel, the Discovery Channel. This has provided an avenue for the dissemination of documentaries, but audiences are especially drawn to programs such as Moonshiners, Ancient Aliens, UFO Files, and the Nostradamus Effect. You know, on the Animal Planet channel, two specials entitled Mermaids, The Body Found, and Mermaids, The New Evidence, which broadcast back in 2012 and 2013, they gave the cable outlet its highest ratings in its 17-year history. <laughs> and these fake documentaries were assumed to be real by many viewers, which prompted the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to issue a statement stating that mermaids do not actually exist. Yes. Yes. 
And it's almost too easy to mention the Learning Channel, a.k.a. TLC, which has achieved its highest ratings by turning to reality programs such as Toddlers and Tiaras and this notorious spin-off, Here Comes Honey Boo Boo. As another variation on the insight that the medium is the message, Hannah Arendt insisted that, that, and I quote, there are no dangerous thoughts, thinking itself is dangerous. <laughs> so the question we are left with is, do all of our amazing new media and technologies allow us the space and time to pause, reflect, and think things over, or is our ability to think drowned out in a flood of images and noise, pushed aside in favor of calculation and automation. And at this point, you might imagine that if we could travel back in time and show Benjamin Franklin how things have turned out, he might have put his kite back in his closet, <laughs> never ventured out into the thunderstorm to unleash the power of, le of electricity. But I think it more likely that he would have sat down to write up some ideas about how we might be able to keep our republic, what we'd have to do to counter the biases of the brave new world his discovery would unleash. And we'll begin with asking the general semantics question, what is going on? And we'll begin with understanding, I quote McLuhan on this, there is no inevitability as long as there is a willingness to contemplate what is happening. Contemplating the contemporary media environment is one of the purposes of media ecology scholarship. And critical evalu evaluation is one of the main skills honed by general semantics training. You know, Abraham Lincoln characterized our democratic experiment as the last best hope of Earth, but he also expressed his concern about, quote, a nation so unhappily distracted but now it's not the horror of a civil war that has sidetracked us. Rather, we find ourselves diverted from a higher calling by a constant stream of entertainment, information, and innovation. And this speaks to the future of humanity in its entirety, especially in an era of convergence and globalization. And it all comes down to the question, can we think and can we talk about what we are doing and where we are going. We live in the midst of a tempest by which I refer to the turbulent nature of the electronic media environment as it's evolved via digital technologies. Wave after wave of changes to our modes of communication and interaction, our tools for thought and social action have altered and continue to alter our societies and our cultures as well as our psyches and ourselves. As human beings, we are certainly well equipped to survive a passing storm, but it is far from clear whether we can build a sustainable way of life in the midst of permanent upheaval, be it natural or cultural. How are we to survive? And can we do so while keeping our humanity intact? There's no turning back the clock, no point in arguing that we abandon our media and technology and try to retrieve an earlier age, a, a less advanced way of life. Nor does it make a sense to deny that there are legitimate benefits that our inventions have brought us. What we need to do then is to engage in concerted evaluation of what we're doing, how we're going about doing it, to carefully weigh the costs and benefits of our technologies, to consider what are the appropriate uses of our media and what uses might be inappropriate, and to proceed with caution understanding that our innovations will always result in unanticipated effects, many of which will be undesirable. And to provide just a few practical suggestions, we need to strengthen our commitment to the spoken word, to conversation, public speaking, and oral performance, and reading out loud. We need to place greater emphasis on the written word, on literacy, that practice of deep and sustained reading that requires sustained periods of quiet time, and that takes effort of the sort pioneered by the movement to observe a weekly technology Sabbath. 
Ultimately, though, what is needed is cultural change, and that ought to include strengthening the four cornerstones of the American experiment, all of which were products of literate culture shaped by typographic media. The four cornerstones, democratic politics, a free press, religion, and schooling. You know, Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, includes the line, oh, brave new world that has such people in it, from which Huxley took the title of his prophetic novel. Shakespeare's main character, Prospero, is a powerful sorcerer living in exile. And like Prospero, we too possess extraordinary powers through the use of media and technologies that are nothing short of magical. Shakespeare concludes his play with Prospero finally willing to give up his sorcery in order to embrace the world of rationality and reconciliation with family and community. Can we do the same? Perhaps not entirely abandoning our gifts, but being mindful of their context and our need for balance? To once again invoke Ecclesiastes, can we recall that there is a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. Can we remember that despite the fact that within the electronic media environment that we inhabit, the time's always the same, a uniform 24-7, 365. Can we create what McLuhan referred to as counter environments, safe spaces where the biases of the electronic media do not hold sway, such as can be found in religious and spiritual sanctuaries and sacred spaces, in schools and sites devoted to art and creative expression. Against the fact that we have been fiddling about as we are amusing and forming and amazing ourselves to death, can we find the means, the method, the way to start speaking, thinking, and teaching ourselves back to life? That's the question I leave you with. Thank you very much.